fantastic partnership. Thank you very much. That's the best way to celebrate Nokia. Let's talk about quantum computing. 1981, particle physicist, quantum physicist, Richard Feynman, imagined a new type of computer that can simulate nature directly. To simulate nature directly. Because nature is quantum. He called it a quantum computer. 40 years later, the industry has made a fundamental breakthrough. 40 years later, just last year, a fundamental breakthrough. It is now possible to make one logical qubit. One logical qubit. One logical qubit that's coherent, stable, and error corrected. In the past, now that one logical qubit consists of, could be sometimes tens, sometimes hundreds of physical qubits all working together. As you know, qubits, these particles, are incredibly fragile. They could be unstable very easily. Any observation, any sampling of it, any environmental condition causes it to become decoherent. And so it takes extraordinarily well-controlled environments and now also a lot of different physical qubits for them to work together and for us to do error correction on these, what are called auxiliary, or syndrome qubits for us to error correct them and infer what that logical qubit state is. There are all kinds of different types of quantum computers, superconducting, photonic, trapped ion, stable atom, all kinds of different ways to create a quantum computer. Well, we now realize that it's essential for us to connect a quantum computer directly to a GPU supercomputer so that we could do the error correction, so that we could do the artificial intelligence calibration and control of the quantum computer, and so that we could do simulations collectively, working together, the right algorithms running on the GPUs, the right algorithms running on the QPUs, and the two processors, the two computers working side by side. This is the future of quantum computing. Let's take a look. There are many ways to build a quantum computer. Each uses qubits, quantum bits, as its core building block. But no matter the method, all qubits, whether superconducting qubits, trapped ions, neutral atoms or photons, share the same challenge. They're fragile and extremely sensitive to noise. Today's qubits remain stable for only a few hundred operations, but solving meaningful problems requires trillions of operations. The answer is quantum error correction. Measuring disturbs a qubit, which destroys the information inside it. The trick is to add extra qubits and tangle so that measuring them gives us enough information to calculate where errors occurred without damaging the qubits we care about. It's brilliant but needs beyond state-of-the-art conventional compute. That's why we built NVQ-Link, a new interconnect architecture that directly connects quantum processors with NVIDIA GPUs. Quantum error correction requires reading out information from qubits, calculating where errors occur, and sending data back to correct them. NVQ-Link is capable of moving terabytes of data to and from quantum hardware the thousands of times every second needed for quantum error correction. At its heart is CUDA-Q, our open platform for quantum GPU computing. Using NVQ-Link and CUDA-Q, researchers will be able to do more than just error correction. They will also be able to orchestrate quantum devices and AI supercomputers to run quantum GPU applications. Quantum computing won't replace classical systems. They will work together, fused into one accelerated quantum supercomputing platform. Wow, this is a really long stage.
You know, CEOs, we don't just sit at our desk typing. It's, this is a physically job, physical job. So, so today we're announcing the MV, MVQ link, MVQ link. And it's made possible by two things. Of course, this interconnect that does quantum computer control and calibration, quantum error correction, as well as connects two computers, the QPU and our GPU supercomputers to do hybrid simulations. It is also completely scalable. It doesn't just do error correction for today's number of few qubits. It does error correction for tomorrow, where we're gonna essentially scale up these quantum computers from the hundreds of qubits we have today to tens of thousands of qubits, hundreds of thousands of qubits in the future. So we now have an architecture that can do control, co-simulation, quantum error correction, and scale into that future. The industry support has been incredible. Between the invention of CUDA Q, remember CUDA was designed for GPU, CPU, accelerated computing. Basically using both processors to do, use the right tool to do the right job. Now CUDA Q has been extended beyond CUDA so that we could support QPU and have the two processors, QPU and the GPU, work and have computation move back and forth within just a few microseconds. The essential latency to be able to cooperate with the quantum computer. So now CUDA Q is such an incredible breakthrough adopted by so many different developers. We are announcing today 17 different quantum computer industry companies supporting the MVQ link. And, and I'm so excited about this, eight different DOE labs, Berkeley, Brookhaven, Fermi Labs in Chicago, Lincoln Laboratory, Los Alamos, Oak Ridge, Pacific Northwest, San Diego National Lab. Just about every single DOE lab has engaged us working with our ecosystem of quantum computer companies and these quantum controllers so that we could integrate quantum computing in, into the future of science. Well, I have one more additional announcement to make. Today, we're announcing that the Department of Energy is partnering with NVIDIA to build seven new AI supercomputers to advance our nation's science. I have to have a shout out for Secretary Chris Wright. He has brought so much energy to the DOE, a surge of energy, a surge of passion to make sure that America leads science again. As I mentioned, computing is the fundamental instrument of science and we are going through several platform shifts. On the one hand, we're going to accelerate computing. That's why every future supercomputer will be GPU based supercomputer. We're going to AI so that AI and principled solvers, principled simulation. Principled physics simulation is not going to go away, but it could be augmented, enhanced, scaled, use surrogate models, AI models, working together. We also know that principled solvers, classical computing, could be enhanced to understand the state of nature using quantum computing. We also know that in the future, we have so much signal, so much data we have to sample from the world Remote sensing is more important than ever. And these laboratories are impossible to experiment at the scale and speed we need to unless they're robotic factories, robotic laboratories. So all of these different technologies are coming into science at exactly the same time. Secretary Wright understands this and he wants the DOE to take this opportunity to supercharge themselves and make sure that the United States stay at the forefront of science. I want to thank all of you for that. Thank you. Let's talk about AI. What is AI? Most people would say that AI is a chatbot, and it, it's rightfully so. There's no question that ChatGPT is at the forefront of what people would consider AI. However, just as you see right now, these scientific supercomputers are not going to run chatbots. They're going to do basic science. Science, AI, the world of AI is much, much more than a chatbot. Of course, the chatbot is extremely important, and AGI is fundamentally critical. Deep computer science, incredible computing, 
great breakthroughs are still essential for AGI. But beyond that, AI is a lot more. AI is, in fact, I'm going to describe AI in a couple different ways. This first way, the first way you think about AI is that it has completely reinvented the computing stack. The way we used to do software was hand coding. Hand coding software running on CPUs. Today, AI is machine learning, training, data intensive programming, if you will, trained and learned by AI that runs on a GPU. In order to make that happen, the entire computing stack has changed. Notice, you don't see Windows up here. You don't see CPU up here. You see a whole different, a whole fundamentally different stack. Everything from the need for energy. And this is another area where our administration, President Trump gets, deserves enormous credit. His pro-energy initiative, his recognition that this industry needs energy to grow. It needs energy to advance and we need energy to win. His recognition of that and putting the weight of the nation behind pro-energy growth completely changed the game. If this didn't happen, we could have been in a bad situation. And I want to thank President Trump for that. <laughs> On top of energy are these GPUs. And these GPUs are connected into, built into infrastructure that I'll show you later. On top of this infrastructure, which consists of giant data centers like easily, many times the size of this room, an enormous amount of energy, which then transforms the energy through this new machine called GPU supercomputers to generate numbers. These numbers are called tokens. The language, if you will, the computational unit, the vocabulary of artificial intelligence. You can tokenize almost anything. You can tokenize, of course, the English word. You can tokenize images. That's the reason why you're able to recognize images or generate images. Tokenize video, tokenize 3D structures. You can to tokenize chemicals and proteins and genes. You can to tokenize cells. Tokenize almost anything with structure, anything with information content. Once you can tokenize it, AI can learn that language and the meaning of it. Once it learns the meaning of that language, it can translate, it can respond just like you respond, just like you interact with ChatGPT, and it could generate just as ChatGPT can generate. So all of the fundamental things that you see ChatGPT do, all you have to do is imagine what if it was a protein? What if it was a chemical? What if it was a 3D structure like a factory? What if it was a robot? And the token was understanding behavior and tokenizing motion and action. All of those concepts are basically the same, which is the reason why AI is making such extraordinary progress. And on top of these models are applications. Transformers, transformers, is not a universal model, it's an incredibly effective model, but there's no one universal model, it's just that AI has universal impact. There are so many different types of models. There's, in the last several years, we enjoyed the invention and went through the innovation breakthroughs of multimodality. There's so many different types of models. There's CNN models, competition neural network models, there's state-space models, the graph neural network models, Multimodal models, of course, all the different tokenizations and token methods that I just described. You could have models that are spatial in its understanding, optimized for spatial awareness. You could have models that are optimized for long sequence, 